And it is an honor to introduce David. Oh, hi, David. <laughs> <laughs> David Sirkoak, I can't say it quite right, but I will say this right. He's from Akliat, Nunavut. And every year since we've had this institute, David has done, has done his presentation, and I look forward to it each time, and I get something different from it each time that David does it. So I'd like to bring David forward, and a good welcome for our elder, David, our Inuit elder from Nunavut. You guys guessed it. Inuit men are sh short. <laughs> I was trying to uh, get John to pronounce my name properly. I said, just call me David Sikwak or Hikwak. He, he passed the test, but I have to say he has that Saskatchewan Cowboyish pronunciation, sir, quack, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> is this working? This is good. I can sit and talk. Uh, before I start my uh, now or less uh, presentation, I am 25 minutes late, but I will. Uh, finish my talk and we'll have coffee after I finish my talk. I was about 20, I think. I was in a band in Eskimo Point. That's how far back. Today it's called Akviet. All my bandmates were about the same age, 20, 21, 22. We were called icebergs. I was a bass player, and every so often we would get some beer and occasionally Canadian whiskey. A friend of mine was planning to go to Churchill for a conference, and I said to him, can you bring me back a bottle of CC uh, or Canadian whiskey. Days are so long. Finally, he came and said, Here's your bottle. Without thinking or reading the label, I invite my band members uh, to come right away. Bring some pop. So they came right away, three of us, four, maybe four. And I evenly pour everything from the bottle and top it with Coke. What I didn't know was it was baby duck wine. <laughs> As we go up, just gobble it quick, and nothing happens. It was just like having a pop. <laughs> so, I, 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 from that day, I never had baby duck again. Then, <laughs> make the long story short. In 1983, I stopped drinking altogether. So it's still counting. I'm going to start off by sharing with you a very short clip of uh, videos, video music, which is about my background and also a group of Inuit from northern Quebec, from Inukjok, that were removed from their hometown to high Arctic, way, way up where Santa Claus lived. And uh, the song is about also about my background, where 
my group from Anada Lake, from west coast of Hudson Bay. If you travel further away south towards Manitoba, where uh, tree line stops, Anada Lake sits there. And we were also subject of uh, removal by federal government by force in 49 to Manitoba border and also to west coast of Hudson Bay in in 56, 57. So the song is uh, very touchy for me. Uh, every time I watch the song, I learn more about it. I want you to have a uh, a, a clear look on people you will see the facial expression by Inuit and then Inuit and listen to the song uh, very carefully. Uh, in about half an hour, I'll get back into uh, the story about that song. So uh, please play the song. It's called Back in 58. It was in 58 My life was just so great In my zone I'm happy to be With my loved ones close to me Along came an aeroplane Carrying Constable Jane He said for me to get on the plane What do you do when your life's put in a shoe? Telling you what to do In a world that's new to you Thought life was just so great. Uh, 
The song is composed by uh, Sam Tittenwalk of Rankin Inlet. Uh, he went down to Achved for a meeting, and he happened to uh, stay with one of our elders. And he was told about our background, and the song came about. It's it's very nice song. So this is very first time I well try to use this. <laughs> is it safe? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> this uh, I'm gonna try to. I gave you a very quick snapshot of uh, a brief history of my group, or Inuit in general. But I will often focus on my group or my region of Kivalluk, around Akvet. This photograph was taken in mid-50s, maybe early 50s, uh, around Anadai Lake, if not in Anadai Lake. That is typical family, and these uh, four youngsters. Two of them are still with us today. Uh, in the center is my mother. Uh, this big boy who knows how to walk is having a, a big ride. I don't know why I wasn't walking around that day. And another boy with an arrow it's uh, my good friend, Tommy Olajit, who lives in Akhvet today, or back then Eskimo Point in the old days. And this is last year. Uh, he asked me to go to Akhvet for his 40-something reading anniversary. So I'd be seeing, I call him big guy. I'd be seeing him again. Uh, on the 19th to 22nd uh, next week when I go to Akhvet. See, I don't know this. Oh, there you go. All Inuit in general uh, have one name before uh, we were interrupted by uh, by the government or people coming in from uh, over, over the ocean, that sort of stuff, before explorers, before missionaries, before traders, etc. Just to give you an example, before the interference, all of us, even my parents, just have one name. You do, we don't need lots of other middle names. Her surname name was very very important part of starting a family, and usually parents get the first name of your wife or yourself. Then sometimes. People living a good life with a good hunter never got, get hungry. Some people ask to be born among them. When they have a child coming up, they may request, I want to be with your family. Can you name your next baby after me so I can live among you? And also, almost immediately, if an elder or a parent passed away, the name come back via baby. In my group, that is so. Before we moved to the coast, or in the eyes of the government, to civilized world, I just have one name, Hikwa. When Garman saw this little baby, they add another name. Even six year two. 
that was also become my name for the government, for the RCMP, for the welfare worker. And I'm supposed to wear it around my neck or attach it to my shoulder so they have easy access to my name, E16 year two. After we moved to the coast, then we were taken by either Catholic or Anglican uh, ministries. My family become Anglicans. Then we also again heard it one by one, said, you are now Andy, Mary, Silas, Winnie, and David. Now you are a Christian. Don't you forget. Then we were introduced to Western education. Officers cannot pronounce Hikwa. So close sister Hikwa is S E R K O A K, Zerkwa. That is my name today. But in Akvet, everyone called me Hikwa. In the 60s, Carmen do once and changes again to all the Inuit in the Eastern Arctic, maybe throughout the Arctic, called Suriname Project. They hired a gentleman named Abe Ukbik who visit every community, every, visit every household, as every man and woman. How, what name they want to go under. So my father, my brother, and myself had three different surnames. Miki, Ilangiayok, and Serkwa. Just to get back to name passing, this is an elder, Hikwak, uh, or Hikwakalak, or Big Hikwak, before me. I am named after him. And his song become mine when he passed away. So I have a granddaughter named after me, the song we share. She has it in her, her treasure chest. And when I'm gone up there or here, and not sure it's yet, <laughs> she will become a sole owner. And this is my uh, late mother and I in 50s. And this is what the name looked like in 40s and 50s and uh, part of 60s when we register to a uh, police station. They go by region. It started in my region in Eskimo Point. So it started as E11 starting and E2, E3, E4, E5, all the way up to northern Quebec. Then Western Arctic become W1, W2, W3, that sort of stuff. Transportation, pretty much uh, across the Arctic, kayak or kayak. Uh, winter time, it's uh, either by foot, if you don't have any docks, and also uh, uh, by dock team. And soon as we were removed from uh, Anadai Lake, there were lots of other Inuit group in 50s that were also removed by force. The two or well, three are well-documented moves right to today. The first group were from northern Quebec, from Port Harrison. Now, Inukjok, by ship C.D. Howe, they went all the way up to no man's land at the top of the world, to Grace Fjord, uh, Resolute Bay. And they are still up there, and it's become their home. And some moved back down to uh, Port Harrison or Inukjok, but after 20, 30, 40 years, things have changed. 
Another group, this group I often go to uh, Dolomite Mountains National Park uh, over the last three summers. And every, every trip I talk to the group and they tell me about how they were moved from Hebron and Anuta to different places. Pretty much the same procedure by officers from Newfoundland that they have to move. And they did also by force and also by uh, promises that weren't kept. One elder told me that government officials invited all of them to their church. Memory, Mer, what's that church group? Uh, Labrador, Meridian, uh, to a big church and tell them that they will move. There's a reason for that. Inuit usually listen in the house of God. They pray and they listen to people. And they were told, you are moving on this day, and they did. To name what was River and Makovic. Then there, there is us and a dial lake. If you're not sure about where it is, I'll show you in the map later on, but it's in towards west coast of Hudson Bay, right in the tree line. Uh, if you follow the tree line, it will lead you to uh, Manitoba. They move us down to Knowlton Lake, uh, also by force. Just get out of your tent, go to the plane. And I'll get back to that a bit later. Then in mid-50s, after we walk back from no northern uh, border of uh, Manitoba, we walk back over the course of three months back to Anadal Lake. A few years later, they put us on the plane again to North Hanik Lake, which is between Anadal Lake and Eskimo Point, somewhere in between, right in a tree line. Three, three days walk is a little Hudson Bay post called Patley. Men walk back and forth over the course of three days in the star, starvation days. And we all, when we first moved to North Hanik Lake, tents are set up already for us by the government, a little food rations in each tent with flour, lard, that sort of stuff. And that food gone right away. Then I'll get back to that later, but we all make an exodus to, um, to Padley. Then we were moved to the coast of Hudson Bay. That first move also was by plane. All the elders told us on that terrible day when three men came, a so heavy equipment operator, RCMP, and one other, one other hand. They were asked or signaled to get out of the tent. And signal was given, bulldoze all the tents by tractor back and forth and buried all our stuff. And they instruct us to, to go to the plane, which was waiting. And second move to North, North Hanik Lake. That is where all the terrible 
death uh, took place, plus in the first move too, due to starvation and uh, sickness. Several people died uh, of starvation and also to uh, cold exposure. Maybe one or two kayak incident and coupled by um, two men by murder. Short time after all of this, uh, short rations were used up. Everyone was on their own, per family. And a strong one survived. All walked to Hudson Bay Patley, which is three days away. From there, we were once again airlifted to Eskimo Point until all the investigations are over. Then we were put on into a boat again, this time north to Whale Cove. Then the landing was not in favor of the captain. We were rerouted to Rankin Inlet where men work uh, at the surface at the nickel mine. And women start to start sewing uh, to, for crafts and stuff. But before we got too comfortable in Rankin, once again, we were uh, shipped down this time south of Rankin Inlet to Whale Cove, our original destination. And Rehab Center was born with our group as the first, uh, maybe Tess, uh, Ray Wilco uh, was born, which is um, it's big, getting bigger. We really have to adapt fast to the coastal living. We never seen seals or walrus or whales or even don't know about high tide, low tide. A few, a few times we got caught in tide, we really have to rush to the mainland. We tried to drink water, it's terrible. It's all salt, we didn't know that. We're so used to just fresh water. Introduction to Western uh, education, Feather Day School, it was pretty harsh for all of us because we never been to uh, school before. And it depends on who's your teacher, it's, it's go by their province. If he has a good day, then you don't get a strap. But there were bad many, bad days were lots. We are not used to clock. We're not used to money. We're not used to work schedule. And we're just being introduced to welfare. What, it, what, what is welfare? And also, our parents were introduced to carving to make tomorrow's, uh, to buy tomorrow's food. And almost immediately, Government ship match boxes, just a little. It's like um, those metal boxes in a big ship container, square. We call them uh, match match box. They were uh, all over the place. The school was open. Mrs. Stevenson, Mr. Romberg, Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Fritland, that sort of stuff. But we were told right away whether we understand our teacher or not. Keep your language outside the door. Keep your culture outside the door. Here in my classroom is a rule. One, it's English, English, English. Then there's another group, uh, Anglican and Church, also telling us 
whether we are truly Christians or not, but telling us, now you are a child of God. You are a Christian. This is sin, this is not. So this is your new life. Abandon your beliefs. Abandon seminism. Abandon drum dancing, throat singing, arrange marriages. They are part work of the devil. So we don't want to go to hell, I guess. So we listen and we are told Sunday is a day of rest. It should be no physical work, rest, and don't even fix your clothes. At this time, Ottawa hired many, many Kaplunat or white people to be in charge of your community. For instance, uh, my home was Well Cove from 59 to 69. And we have several salmon managers, they were called, equivalent to Indian agent. They have the same power. They rule you. And you need to have a habit of nicknaming people. Uh, white people coming in, uh, police, uh, ministers, that sort of stuff. They all have nick nicknames. Some they know their nicknames and some of them don't know. And this Silman manager in uh, 64, 65, he was a very thin, tall man, very skinny from Netherlands. We call him Kutjangayuk, the upside down man. <laughs> he has a very bald forehead all the way up here, big beard. Kutjangayuk, <laughs> his head should be this way. Um, plus, he need to take him. Um, in awareness workshops. <laughs> His name was Finn Lawrenson. Oops. Am I, am I making a mistake? Uh, losing your language? Uh, losing your culture? OK. And I just had to uh, expade. OK. Inuit movement, at, at first, in Eastern Arctic, Inuit finally know their uh, rights to vote in f uh, federal election, but we don't know it back then. And I think it was just before 1965, we were on the sea ice as kids, and a small plane circled circle us. And it's, each fly over, it get lower and lower. And I guess on a final flyby, someone opened the window and just Poor little leaflets. It was like it was like a rain, uh, with paper. With our limited pronunciation, there's a little with a picture. Luckily, we know our vegetables and fruit, apples and oranges, that sort of stuff, banana. And they said, orange. I got excited, orange. It's like, you're going to eat orange? And he said, bud, 
but but orange. Vote for but orange. I don't know if you vote for uh, but orange that year, <laughs> but I, I remember my dad or my father, uh, late Mickey, cast his fir uh, first vote, and I have a photograph for with it, and. Uh, the, the man in charge was Tega Curley, who was, was a long time uh, politician from from my region. Tega Curley helping my father how to vote. That uh, was throughout. If you look up north, there's lots of regions: Inuvialuit, Nunavut, and Nunatsiavut, and Nunavik. And I couldn't focus on uh, Nunavut. Nunavut means our land. If you in Kaluit, it's it's your it's your land too. You in Nunavut, not just in for Inuit, but if you in it, it's your land too. Nunavut that means our land. Capital is Iqaluit. Uh, but if you in first year or Canadian North, they call it Ikaluit. <laughs> it's supposed to be Ikaluit. And there are two choices, either Rankin or Ikaluit. Ikaluit was a clear winner, very easy. But at the time, I, I didn't vote for Ikaluit. <laughs> and there's Nunavik. Nunavik the great land, northern Quebec, capital is Gujarat. It's like Nunavut, it's a very nice country, very nice, great land. I go there quite often. And uh, Nunatsiavut, our beautiful land, uh, province or territory of uh, Labrador, I think it's in Nain and Hopedale, our capital, I'm not sure. But also, uh, it's very new. I was there in 2005 when they signed their papers in Nain Labrador. I'll get to that later. And there is Nunatsiak, beautiful land, Northwest Territories, which was our former um, bud or buddy before we break away. Yellowknife is their capital. And I will <clears throat> sort of uh, make a quick uh, important points uh, leading up to Nunavut. In 50s, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are lots of relocating Inuit, not just the three, but there were lots of others being forced into bigger communities. So the government can keep an eye on the group and introduce uh, uh, services. And 60s, all of the Eastern Arctic Inuit, whether they know it or not, the, their first right to vote in federal elections. And I remember 67, that's also was when Toronto Maple Leafs win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> I was 15, <laughs> and in the NWT Council moved from here up to Yellowknife. Just as the council to look after Indian Eskimo affairs. 70 uh, original or COPE was formed in western part of Inuit Nunat around Inu. Uh, Inuvialuit region or around Inuvik. And things were happening very fast. And ITK, or Eskimo, Eskimo Brotherhood, was formed as a, in a little room. Uh, Tagak Curley, again, was the founding uh, figure of Inuit Tapiri Kanatami. 
than it's today ITK. And we were told, you Inuit now has a voice, or you Eskimos have a voice. Then I sort of want to test it. I was just getting the workforce as a half-time classroom assistant, sometime half-time half janitor. Uh, government said, half-time this week, full-time next week. Uh, no one know, know what's happening. So I phoned newly formed ITK. Tell them my blues. I end of the conversation said, well, send someone to Eskimo Point to talk to you. A few days later, knock on the door. It was Ivan Maud from ITK. Not related to Farley Maud, but <laughs> we talked. He go to school. A few days later, he he went back to Ottawa a week later. Half a position from Inuvik was transferred to Eskimo Point, so I can have a full-time job. And it never, from that day, I never looked back. I retired from teaching in 2012. Then another one was McIntyre Valley Pipeline. It was exciting even for us who were far away in the east. We hear about it daily on CBC, CBC uh, channel at night. <clears throat> um, it was with Fraser reporting and Judge Berger talking to uh, all the Denny people along the, along the line. With all this happening, uh, Cope, who was the very first one to s become a body, were anxious to, I guess, to make the uh, long story short, there's lots of uh, resources in that area. They break away from ITK and form their own uh, land claim. I think they're very rich today, own, own lots of big things. And ATK in 1980 passed a paper to create Nunavut. All this was, even for us, pretty, pretty, kind of shy. And we usually don't say, we want, we want, oh, make, make too much noise. <laughs> and Ottawa was starting to, to listen to Inuit. It's young men, just out of, out of high school were determined to do something. They fall, they rise, they fall, they rise. It was talk of the day, talk of the region, talk of the east. So plebiscite, NWT, everyone, vote, break or not break. East want break. West wants stay with us. So 56% was the goal. There was a line. So immediately, all the Inuit built a wall <laughs> of snow. <laughs> the line was chosen. You know what, as a principal in 1990, was in the works. Signing in Iglulik, 95 come, comes around, okay, let's vote for capital. What, what did I do? And everyone vote again, 
vote for Rankin or Iqaluit. With Iqaluit, with all the hotels, top of the line, airstrip, more housing, government offices, it was an easy win for Iqaluit. And soon after, government of uh, federal government appointed Jack Anawak to be the very first interim commissioner for Nunavut. That is coming up and build what the offices would look like, who would start as a assistant to be the minister, that sort of stuff. And 1999 came. It was like a big birthday party that you were invited a long time ago. Uh, it's finally here. I thought the whole Eastern Arctic will, will be partying. Oh, there are lots of parties, but it was very orderly. <laughs> It was so, it was so fun. And the whole Canada was focusing on Iqaluit. I was uh, principal at the elementary school. Every morning, come in to view someone. Every afternoon, what do you think of Nunavut? I mean, every day, all the schools. But they will go shortly so we don't mind talking to them. Big day came, and we don't even have a house yet or a legislative assembly. High school gym was uh, a house, Nunavut house. Prime Minister and his uh, ministers were there. Christian was there, and all the new we were the shakers and new ministers of Nunavut. And they said a year later, can your school perform at the at, at, uh, creation of Nunavut April 1st? I said, okay, if uh, if the children are in charge. So we agreed, they agreed. They gave us a little V corner like here to do a, a very short run dance. And we did. And they made a very special drum that I used. I normally don't push people, but I was pushing people that day all the way from Christian down to sign my drum, sign my drum. It was just full of signatures. And I went home and I looked at the drum. I said, I don't deserve this drum. This should not be mine. I am just a drum dancer and just a teacher. I didn't create Nunavut. So I put my parka again drive up to John Amakwalik. He said, he should be the rightful owner. Hopefully he will. Hopefully he still have the drum. <laughs> and also, the years, year later, map of Canada uh, was revised as we see it today. And I always think back and say how lucky the Inuit were although it took 30, 30 years or close to 30 years from a dream to Nunavut. And look back uh, other places around the world and see if they try something similar, they probably would go to jail or get killed or expelled. I mean, how, how lucky we were uh, many of the, the fathers of Nunavut, most are still living today. And 
I think I uh, mentioned many of this already. To, uh, it was pretty excited for me in 2005. I was asked to uh, to be a drum dancer in Nain, Labrador, for this special uh, signing ceremony with Premier Williams. Drumming part was very good, but what I witnessed, I will never forget in my whole life. At the front like this were elders sitting, and before Premier Williams and uh, K, uh, LIA officials in Inuit Labrador Association. First thing on the agenda was to make an apology to these people who were selected to be sitting in the front, who were removed by Newfoundland government in 50s. Ah, it was very moving. Very moving. And I work with many kids all over Nunavut, Nunavik. And over the three summers, I go to uh, Durham White Mountains National Park. And it's usually young people from all different settlements of uh, Nunatsiavut, or Labrador, for a week to two weeks, and work with elders. Two summers ago, they have a poetry program going, or writing program. And every day they would draft a poem about the region about the visiting elders that week. Julia was my writer, or she was interviewing me. She also become a very good drum dancer, even today. After many, many hours, she composed a poem about me. I'd like to read it to you. My elder David Sikok of Nunavut, Akvet Nunavut. I was born in northern 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 lake, Nolten Lake, at Nunavut, Manitoba border, southwest of Hudson Bay. My parents and sometimes my brothers and sisters looked after me. In the 1950s, our lifestyle was nomadic. Sometimes we were hungry. I was growing up in the old Inuit way. We were encouraged to learn skills through games. I learned to help my mother and father. My mother, her mom, used skullik, a soapstone cooker. My house in winter was an igloo. My house in summer was a caribou skin tent. My group was called a helmet, the inland people. My family dried caribou and freshwater fish. We used every bit of caribou, the skin, and the meat. My parents encouraged me when I was growing up. They often praised me. I learned a lot from my mother, mainly hunting or makai. With her, I got my first caribou. She is the one who really advised me on how to become a man. I went to Frederick Day School in Rankin Inlet and Whale Cove. It wasn't a good experience. I got strapped and went to go, go away from the school. 
I was a very poor learner. The only thing I liked was there was a warm room and snacks. My first job was painting rocks around the government office. Then I worked at the whaling station. I remember being in a camp away from the community at Whale Cove. I could walk around all I want, day and night. I remember I could go hunting with my father and go fishing every day. I remember the welfare day. It was a chance for good food. I don't like being, I don't like the name calling. I was called poor and dumb. My family was called the lowest of the low. I knew that wasn't true, but there was pain. And she did a great job. She did a great job. Oh. Now, I'd like to conclude um, by sharing a bit of dumb dancing with you. And, and if you are sitting close to uh, uh, there's something on a chair behind you called Drummer Boy. If you're sitting on a chair with that Drummer Boy, you are a lucky one. It's, uh, it's in the front, Drummer Boy. And there should be one more. Are you? Okay, if you're sitting, sitting close to one of them, please come uh, join me. I will teach you how to drum dance. <laughs> Grab one, please. It's very simple. Uh, if your left hand, this is, if your right hand, it's tricky already. Yeah. <laughs> and your wrist is doing all the work. Otherwise, you will be a very stiff drum dancer, like, <laughs> like this. And if you like drumming like that, that's okay. But most drummers do not. So wrist is doing all the work like this. And you cut up. You only hit it here and also here. And if you match, yeah, you, you match that already. Nick should be uh, making the sound. Remember your wrist? This, yeah, you're doing right, good. Both, this one too, yeah. Like this, one, two, one. No, what, look at this, one, Like that, okay, good. Now we're getting somewhere. Yes. Now, just in case you get mixed up in your head, count one, two, one, two, one, two, like this. One, two, one. You got getting good already. And every second beat, like every second number two, you move your knees like this. One. And make a full circle like this. is not 
not compulsory. You don't have to uh, ye yell or anything. Most drummers at this part. Good. Uh, keep coming. It's okay. I think they are ready for a solo <laughs> with a live singing. Many of you watched at an art rock movie before? Yeah. At an art rock. Now, which part of the movie you like the best? <laughs> I know the, I know one. The theme song, right? Mm -hmm. Right, okay, you all agree. <laughs> I'm gonna make an attempt to sing that theme song of Atanak Rock. Soon as, soon as I start uh, <laughs> singing, kick in the drumming, it's about, <laughs> Uh, two minutes long. Okay. okay are we ready? <laughs> it, it's it's called. My song is a timer. Are you ready? I Conclude my uh, talk. If I need extra drummers, <laughs> I know who to call. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>